Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. And this morning I have a message for you. It is the, the two sides. I have a message this morning and I have a message this evening, which is one complete message. It is the two sides, two sides of the same coin. Now, I'm not saying God is just two-sided. That's ridiculous. There are multifacets about our God, our, our master, our king, and we'll never depth the, de- you know, um, mine the depths of his riches and things. But this morning, I want to lay a foundation. And my brother talked about the foundations. The Bible says, when the foundations are being eroded, what can the righteous do? And I want to say, lay a foundation. So this morning, I'm going to talk to you about the love of God. And I want you to tune in your heart, not just your ears, to what God would say to you this morning about his wonderful, amazing love. But tonight, now I know evening services are difficult to come to, and it's a long day, I get all of that, I understand it. But tonight, I would encourage you to come, because this message this morning is really the prequel to the message tonight, which is about the wrath of God, and the subject I'm preaching on tonight is hell. And... um, um, I'll talk more about that tonight in my introduction. I'm not going to say too much about that, but I'm going to be preaching about hell tonight. I know that might sound, oh my goodness, I don't want to come in and hear that. But I tell you, it will be encouraging, challenging. Uh, it will be a blessing. And hopefully you'll go away excited and encouraged. Um, one of my signature messages that I share everywhere I go, I've done it for 35 years, 30 odd years now, in Russia, I preached a message here. It was entitled Messengers, Ministers, and Emissaries. And in it, I lay a foundation of the, it comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And in that passage, we get the motives by which we are to go and preach the gospel. Paul tells us about three motives. He says, number one, since we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. So the fear of the Lord is a motive for us to preach the gospel. And then he further down, he says, the love of, guy, uh, of Christ constrains me. I am, I am constrained to preach the gospel because of God's love. That's the second motive. And the last message, motive, Paul says, from now on, we do not consider men as we once did. God's value of a human being, how much he values people, no matter who they are or how low they've gone, the value of a human being. But today, I'm going to focus this morning on the love of God and tonight on the wrath of God. Uh, Some of you may remember that um, in 2013, I walked the entire length and breadth of Scotland from the very top of the Shetlands, uh, a place called Norwich, which is in Unst, Unst, Yale, Shetland. I didn't walk across the water. That would have been something, wouldn't it? You'd have heard about that if I'd walked across the water. I walked through Orkney. I walked from the very far north right to the very south and then right across from the furthest west to the furthest east in Scotland. And during that time, which took me eight months and over 800 miles, I remember having three rejections. Three rejections where I either offered a a pamphlet, you know, or a tract or something, and people said, oh, I'm not interested in that, who rejected me, like blatantly rejected me. Three out of 800 miles in eight months of witnessing to people. And I want to say to you this morning that people are not anti-God, they're not anti-Christ. Many of them are anti-church. Anti-church because of maybe a bad experience they've had, or anti-church because they've heard from somebody else. They've never set foot in a church. How many conversations I've had with people when they've gone, church is this and church is that, and I ask them, when was the last time you were in church? Oh, when I was 10, I was like, get a life and get to church and stop being stupid. Church is not what you might remember, and it's not what people tell you to be. The true church of Jesus Christ is alive and well and serving Jesus. Amen. Just look about you. It might not be every seat here filled, not, not yet, not just now, but filled with people who are hungry after God and want God and love God. Franklin Graham saw over 520 first-time decisions for Christ when he did his campaign in June the 22nd here in Glasgow. I've seen more people coming to Christ on the streets in meetings like this and uh, on campaigns, more people out in the streets witnessing, more churches out than I've ever seen in my 35 years uh, of full-time ministry for the Lord. They just don't know who God is. I remember when I went into Russia I mean, you, you can't imagine what it was like unless you were there in the early 90s. My wife and I went to Russia three months, three months after the Berlin Wall went down. Not three years, three months. 
And uh, I remember as I flew in and out over the years, I remember flying into Shiramedseva Airport, which was the main airport at that time. And um, we go through all the, the, the checkups and all that, and the KGB and all the soldiers were there. And I remember coming out into where the baggage claim was, and there was this massive sign written in English, and it said this. It said, your image is our business. Your image is our business. First impressions are important. Salesmen, postal uh, uh, workers, co- you know, con men, all of these, they know that first impressions They count, they make a difference, they make an impact. But there's one first impression that we've got all wrong, and that is the character of God. Some time ago, I remember going to Kelvin's side, to Kelvin Hall there, and the paintings, and we see paintings of God, all sorts of depictions, but he's there, as a big, whoa, and he's got a big beard, and he's angry, and firebolts are coming out of his hands, and all of this, and we've got other pictures where he looks like some sort of divine Santa Claus. We have pictures from religion. We have pictures from tradition. We have an angry God. We have a Santa Claus, Santa Claus type of God. We have an indifferent God, or we have a demanding tyrant. Or or a God that just thinks, oh yeah, live the way you want, it doesn't matter. And this morning, I want us to look at one of the key aspects of the character of God, and that is the love of God, God's love. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, and I'm reading from the 94 NIV version, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know God, sorry, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now listen, it doesn't say love is God. It says God is love. Big difference. God is love. And this is how he showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, so we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And we know that we live in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and we rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. These words are so rich and so deep. There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out all fear. All fear. Because fear is to do with punishment and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God and yet he hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot possibly love God whom he has not seen. Sobering words for us, brothers and sisters. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. God is love, the love of God. I remember hearing a story of a lady, uh, sorry, of a a gentleman who was a a missionary in Africa, and he would travel on the same buses as everybody else did. He didn't travel in fancy um, jeeps or anything like that. I had a fancy jeep, so I'm not against fancy jeeps, so don't say I'm anti-fancy jeep. I'm not. And he was on the bus, and he saw this lady, and this lady was, she had kids around her, and she was obviously absolutely poverty-stricken, couldn't 
didn't, you know, her clothes were threadbare, the kids were threadbare, and he thought, it's a proud society where I'm, how can I, how can I help this woman? So what he did is he went into his pocket and he took out some money, which for him was not a lot of money, but for her would have probably been about two months wages or something. And he sidled up to her and he gently tried to drop the money into her pocket or into the bag that was beside her. And as she did, she fe- he did that, she felt this sort of movement and she screamed and suddenly, stop the bus, stop the bus. And so they stopped the bus. He's trying to touch me, he's trying to touch me. And so they got this guy out, this missionary out, and they got him outside, and they were about to give him a, a doing and about to give him a hammering. And he shouts up, and he says, tell the woman to look in her pocket. Tell her to go into her pocket. And as she does, she goes into her pocket, and she doesn't find a handkerchief like mine, but she finds a wad of notes. And they look in absolute surprise. I wasn't trying to harm her. I was trying to bless her. And I want to say to you this morning, and anyone who's listening or watching, God is for you and he's not against you. And he loves you. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. And those who believe shall be saved, but those who choose not to believe shall be condemned because they themselves have chosen not to believe in the name of God's one and only son. He is for you. He is not against you. And we could not have got the impression of God more wrong than we have understanding his very nature. So I've got five points for you this morning. So you stick with me. Number one, Psalm 136. And I'm only going to read maybe two verses because it's such a long psalm. Psalm 136, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to God, the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. And we have for what? 26 verses. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Number one, God's love endures forever. It's never ending. You cannot get to the end of the love of God. It's impossible. There's no height to it, there's no depth to it, there's no breadth to it, there's no width to it. His love endures forever and it never ends. It's as real and relevant for you and I today as it always has been and always will be. Amen. Amen. His love endures forever, hallelujah. The psalm talks about God's unending love. And if you read through that psalm, I encourage you to read through some of these scriptures. For the sake of time, I can't read them for you. But he talks about his character as being good and his love endures forever. His creation, it was created, it was good and his love endures forever. His deliverance, his love endures forever. His power, his love endures forever. His salvation, his love endures forever. And ultimately for you and I, God so loved the world, so you, so Stuart, so Roy, God so loved each and every one of you that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Why? Because his love endures forever. Hallelujah. There's no end to it. You can't come to the end of the love of God. I remember preaching in Dornoch many, many years ago and this couple, the older couple came to Christ. I had the privilege years later of baptizing them both or be. I didn't baptize them. I was part of the group that was there at their baptism when I was on my walk. And they got saved, and they've got a big family up there that spread across Sutherland. And they brought another bunch of their family into the meeting a few days later. And they got saved, and then they brought another couple, and they got saved. And then I was up so many months later, and there happened to be one of the visiting uncles or aunties that came to the meeting. And they got saved. Why? Because God is a God of salvation. And his love endures forever. It's never ending. There's no end to it. Household salvation. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. God is faithful. Whatever you're trusting God with right now, don't give up, don't give in. His love endures forever. It never ends. And even when things don't go the way you hope they go, the Bible says, in all things God works to the good of those who love him and are called unto his purposes. He may not be the author of all things, but in all things he works to the good of those who love him. His love endures forever. He's patient. He's faithful. He's long-suffering. 
I've often, I'm 37 years a Christian this October, 30, no, sorry, 30, more than that, 38 years a Christian this October. I've often wondered, why hasn't he just ended it? Why hasn't he just sort all this mess out? And I believe the answer is very simple. He's given people time to repent and believe. It's like you could imagine our king and there's a, a rebellious island somewhere or a country that's part of our nation and they turned against him. He gives them time to repent, gives them time to think about their ways, gives them time and it looks like he's dragging his heels but it's really his mercy and his grace and his faithfulness. He's giving them time to repent, giving them time to, to come to him. You might have heard a story before, but some time ago, I did a mission in, in, um, in Archer, and it was bucketing with rain. It was right on the, the cusp of a big storm in America, and we got part of it over here. And I had a group of young people, and it was just steroids. I'm not kidding. You just could not go out. You just got soaked. It was impossible. Nobody was anywhere. It was just so heavy rain. And I was getting a bit depressed, a bit discouraged. And one night, one evening, suddenly... A text arrives, and this text came up. I don't know if we can put it on the screen there. This, this text comes up on the screen, and it was my friend up in Dornach. I'm going to read it from mine. You can read it there. Good evening, Malcolm. I hope your mission trip's going well. I've been so blessed this past week and feel so close to the Lord. I thank you for your prayers. I called to see a builder, Jeff, and Caithness on my way home from Orkney today. I think I may have mentioned him to you. I've been witnessing to him about two years, and now I'm giving them various pieces of literature, including your Harvest Scotland car during that time, this one here, called God Loves You. He told me many months ago that his brother-in-law who lives in England was dying of terminal cancer. Jeff questioned why God, if there was one, why would he allow him to suffer so long? I said that my belief that he was, I believed that he was graciously giving time for him to consider his mortality and turn to Jesus. In a recent visit to site, Jeff told me they'd sent your car to his brother-in-law. He had had it next to his bed and he'd been reading it previously uninterested in God. Today, Jeff told me me, his brother-in-law had died earlier in the week, but through reading your card and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, he'd not gone on before crying out to God and receiving Jesus, snatched from the flames, but eternally secure in paradise with Jesus. Praise God. His love endures forever. He loves all people. And believe me, nobody will be in hell because God sent them there. They'll be in hell because they've chosen to reject God and to reject his means of salvation. And you'll hear more of that tonight. God loves people. He wants none to perish, the scripture says, but all to come to repentance and a knowledge of the truth. Some people get the wrong idea or impression that God has prolonged judgment out of spite or some sort of sick sense of revenge. He's proclaiming it out of mercy and patience and faithfulness and love. God is patient with you, wanting none to perish, but all to come to repentance and a knowledge of the truth. Jesus says no one knows the time when he's going to come back. You ever thought why he waited four days? And his friend was in the tomb four days dead before he went and did the greater miracle. Because that miracle brought multitudes into the kingdom as well as many teachers of the law and religious people. God's love is un unending. Unending. It endures forever. Secondly, Psalm 86 verse 5. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call on you. His love is unending, it's also unlimited. There's no limit to the love of God. We live in a society of quick fix, fast food, fast cars, fast service. Everything has to happen now, but it's here one minute and it's gone the next. Some of you might remember years ago when Hale Bop Comet was in our site. Do you remember that? The comet that went across our screen. Hands up if you remember as a brother there. Yeah, many of us do. And I live in the sticks. In fact, I live in a dark sky area, one of the fifth darkest areas in the whole of the world, down in Galloway. And you could go out at night and you could see this comet. It was in the sky for weeks, but it's not there anymore. It's somewhere out there, but it's not there. It came and it went. It comes and it goes. 
here one day, gone the next. God's love's not like that. It's unlimited. It's unending. It's always there. And it's not the quick fix. Some of you have heard me tell the story of the, the Italian hair um, barber who had this uh, a, a, a generational barbers in America somewhere. So he, he ran his barbers, and one day he saw this big building going over the other side of the road, and he was wondering what's going on there. And then he saw it was a big hairdressing conglomeration. It was one of these big hairdressers that had like 25 hairdressers there. And here's he with just his apprentice. He's thinking, oh my goodness. And then as they get near the opening, they put the sign up against the window saying, $5 haircuts. He's thinking, my goodness, I'm going to go out of business, completely out of business. How can I compete with prices like that? He had a brainwave. So the next day, as they came to go and get their $5 haircuts, he put a sign on his window, I fix $5 haircuts. <laughs> There's no quick fix with God. If you want to know God's love, his unending, unlimited love of God, spend time with your father. There's no shortcuts with him. Let him minister to you. Make your quiet time your absolute necessity every day, not out of religious um, observance, but because of love, because you want to be in his presence. God's love is unlimited, unending. Jesus Christ, the best and the great. He didn't, he could have given us Michael or whatever these angels and the creation that he has and the vast universe, and he gives his one and only son. Can you imagine that? For a bunch of undeserving sinners, God cursing people like you and I, and he gave his one and only son. Why? Because his love is unlimited and his love is unending for you and for me. That's the awesome power of the love of God. God's love. I preached a message here oh, last year because Jesus is better than. It was a Bible study in Hebrews. He's better. He's a mediator better covenant, of a better covenant. He's a better sacrifice. He's a better high priest. He's not better than. He's the best of the best. He's the greatest of the greatest. He's not just the king. He's the king of kings. He's not just the Lord. He's the Lord of lords. He's not just the, the, the prince. He's the prince of princes. He is everything. Amen. Man. God doesn't do half measures. I've done a couple of outreaches where I've been blessed to go into care homes. I remember doing one in an Araka mission, and we ended up, I think it was in Dumbarton, and then a, a couple of years ago, we did one with the Blair Gowrie Church, and the, the care homes opened up to us, and when we went into these care homes, every meeting we had, we were seeing 60, 70 of the, the residents and the staff and visitors coming to Christ. Why? Because he loves them. And yes, there might be maybe 92-year-old and sitting there and maybe not quite got everything together, but when they heard, what a friend we have in Jesus, suddenly there's a spark in their eyes lighting up. And when we say, receive Jesus and pray this prayer, they prayed in God, his love for them. And I think about my father who does know Christ, but if he didn't, I would want somebody in a care home to reach out to him if he didn't know Jesus. God wants everybody saved from the top to the old person in the care homes who've been forgotten by friends and family and neglected. His love endures forever. Unlimited love of God. Nothing too great, nothing too small. I had so many stories to tell you, but there's not a chance I'm gonna tell you those stories in the time given to me. Six million he led to the Red Sea and opened up the Red Sea and he walked through it on dry ground, destroying all their enemies behind them. Six million, one man ahead with a stick. And then we see another man, a few years or generations later, another man with a stick. His name was Elijah, but he sends Elijah to one widow in Zarephath who's just preparing her last meal for her son so she can just lay down and die in peace. And he says, make me some cake. Give me a, a bit of Jamaican cake or something or a gingerbread and then go and get oil jars and take them. Bring your oil jars from your neighbors. And she goes, she cooks the cake. He has the cake. She goes out and gets all these jars. And she's fed for the entire time of the famine. 
Six million people who'd been in slavery and bondage. One woman with her son about to die. There's no height and there's no depth. There's nothing too great and there's nothing too small for our God. Unlimited love of God. Jesus would feed 5,000 men and women and children besides and yet go to one woman at a well who's lost and empty and broken because of her broken relationships and seeking after love. And he comes and reaches the one. And then she goes and reaches the multitudes. He sends Philip down to Samaria. An entire city is on fire for God. Miracles, signs, wonders, demons coming out, all kinds of stuff. And then suddenly he whips Philip away and he's beside the chariot of one man. An Ethiopian man reading his Bible in Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading? How kind someone explains it to me. Well, let me get up and give me a seat and I'll explain it to you. And he gets saved. And history tells us that Ethiopian went back and Ethiopia received a revival of its own in history. Nothing too small, nothing too great around for God. He's amazing. When we were in Russia for those 11 years, back and forth, back and forth, at the beginning we were living there. And I remember my wife and I were living there and we were there for six months. And during that time, my, my, my friend, who was my translator, his dad had this, we had a puncture and he had this fancy Russian pump, you know, foot pump. You should see this foot pump, nothing like Halford's one. I mean, this thing like would pump up a jumbo jet. It was just a I was like, oh, I got to have one of them. And so I was looking out for them all the time I was there, six months, and we were seeing multitudes saved, we're seeing healings, we're seeing miracles, signs and wonders, and I'm asking God for a foot pump. I know it sounds crazy, but I was. So it comes to November when we had to get out of the country, and we had to go quickly because the weather was coming in, and like severe weather, minus 20, 30, I had a diesel vehicle, and so we were getting out, and I'm packing up, and the day I'm packing up to go off the next morning, Max arrives with his dad, and there's a shoebox, big shoebox and he hands it to me. I said, what's that? He said, it's a gift from my dad. Opens the door. And what was it? A Russian foot pump. <laughs> I never told him about it. Nothing too great. Nothing too small. Do you know what? It's our pride that won't ask him for the big things and it's our pride that won't ask him for the small things. Mine included. Maybe chew on that. Didn't mean to say that, but maybe chew on it. Nothing too big, nothing too small. And thirdly, we read this in Titus. I'll just read these few verses. Titus 3, verse 3, it says, um, verse 4, sorry. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, it saved us not because of righteous things we'd done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. God's love is unending, it's unlimited, it's also unconditional. The unconditional love of God. The Bible says in Romans, while we were yet sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. The prodigal son who went away taking his father's, part of his father's fortune, never got back in touch until he'd had enough and came back wanting to be made a slave in his household. And did the father make him a slave? He ran out to him, he hugged him, he kissed him, he gave him the best robe, he gave him the ring, he had a party. My son who is dead is now alive. However low anyone has got, whoever they are, it's not low enough for the love of God to reach it. His love's unconditional. I remember, I might have told you this story. Forgive me, I tell stories all the time. And even though I make notes, I, I just, they get muddled up. And I never know where I'm. But I, my wife and I were in Russia. We were in Riga. And we were living in a caravan. Seems like I'm destined to be a nomad. But anyway, we were living in a caravan. This is just after we got married. And... Um, we befriended uh, the Revival Baptist Church in Riga. Good people, lovely people, more charismatic than most of the Pentecostal churches there. And on the Saturday, we would go to the synagogue. That was part of what we did. 
it's another story for another time, but we went, always went to synagogues and to the Jews and we took Bibles and stuff to them. But anyway, I think it was maybe the Friday or the Thursday or the Friday, I had a dream. And what had happened is during the week, this pastor of this Baptist church had said to me, oh, do you want to come to join us in an outreach? And we've got an outreach in the city center on Saturday afternoon. And I said, well, let me pray about it and we'll get back to you because that was normally when we would go to the synagogue. And so um, that's what we did. I had a dream shortly after that. And then the stream... I was fishing. I'm a fly fisherman, by the way. I don't get a lot of time for it nowadays, but I'm a fly fisherman. And in this, in this dream, I was fishing on a river, and I was fishing this pool, and there was another guy further down fishing the pool. And I'm fishing this pool, and suddenly, bang, got into a, a fish. How many here people are, are, are fishermen? How many here? A few. What's wrong with the rest? Anyway, okay, so they're, they're fishing. He gets into a fish, and the excitement of that fish, you know what I'm talking about, brother. And then I noticed that in this dream that somebody downstream, he caught a fish, so he's playing a fish as well. So the two of us are fighting this, this fish. He's fighting this fish. I'm fighting my fish in the swimming pool. And as I'm reeling it in and he's reeling his in, suddenly the line goes up, his line goes up, and what had happened is our lines had snagged together. And neither of us had caught anything. <laughs> so I shared this with my wife the next day. She said, oh, I think maybe you should turn down the, the invitation on Saturday and we should just go to the synagogue as usual. So I just politely did. So I went to the synagogue. And at the end of the synagogue meeting, uh, there was a guy there who, translate, who had, was a translator, a friend of ours. And at the end of the synagogue meeting, they invited me to sit at the back. All the, the guys sat at the back. So I got invited to sit at the back. The woman, my wife was allowed, the ladies weren't allowed to sit with us. It's just the way it was in the synagogue. But we sat and they allowed my wife to sit with us and they asked me to get up and share why I was there. So I got up and preached the gospel in a, a good fashion. I told them about Jesus being Jewish and how I was there and I was saved because of the, a Jew called Jesus. And, and it was amazing because at first of all, I could see them like, ah, and then I could see them warm, honestly warm and suddenly just, they were so grateful and they let us pray for them and everything. It was such a wonderful time. They blessed us. So afterwards, I get his tap on the shoulder, and this chap says to me, he says, oh, I'm, the lo I'm a local Baptist minister, another Baptist church. And he said, um, I go to a ladies' prison on Mondays. Would you and your wife come with me to a ladies' prison? I said, what? We'd love to. So that's exactly what happened. We went into top security prison. Even the wardens wouldn't go in with us. They kind of <laughs> don't want to let us in. <laughs> and we preached to about two, 300 women. And I'm telling you, it was just so... These were the worst of the worst, living in conditions you could hardly imagine. And God just moved. A broken woman receiving Christ. Almost all of them, I would say, responded to the gospel. And we had Bibles and stuff, and we just gave out all the literature and everything else. We were so blessed. So midweek, we're back in the church we were invited to go and have an out. I said, how did it go on Saturday? Oh, my goodness, it was terrible what happened. They said, when we got to the square... This is a true story. When we got to the square to have our outreach, there was another church having an outreach. And there was such an uh, argument and there was a physical altercation between them. And I went, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Just unconditional love of God that would say, let others deal with that. I want you to go here to these women who have just been broken and abused and misused. No conditions to the love of God. Psalm 107, verses 8 and 9, just a couple of verses to read to you to set the tone. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, his wonderful deeds for men. He satisfies the thirsty, fills the hungry with good things. And then we read on in verse uh, 15, let him give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, his wonderful deeds for men. He sent forth his word and healed them and rescued them from the grave. Give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them rejoice, uh, sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. God's love is unending, unlimited, unconditional, and it never, ever fails. It is un failing. And we've read about George Muller and his orphanage times when he had no food for those children and they get together and they sit around the table and they give thanks for the food that wasn't there and suddenly the door would knock on the door and the, the baker would have had a, an excess or crashed outside and the milkman would come and every single time 
every single time. Without fail, he would come and meet their needs and he would provide for them every time without fail, looking after them and keeping them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we read these verses. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, does not boast, it's not proud, not rude, not self-seeking, not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Verse 8, love never fails, never fails. In verse 13 it says, now these three things remain, faith, hope and love, but the greatest of these is love. It's love. It's love. Love never fails. The greatest is love. Ed Cole, Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole, author of Maximize Manhood and founder of the Christian Men's Network, said this, a champion is not one who never loses. He's one who never quits. Who never quits. If you're thinking of quitting here today, God sent me to tell you not to quit. His love is unending, unlimited, unfailing, unconditional. Jesus is the champion of champions, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And I encourage you that if you are believing for the salvation of loved ones or the deliverance for something, don't give up. God never, ever fails. I have a magnet on my fridge in my office at home, and it's a quote from William Chur uh, Winston Churchill, never, never, never quit. God's love is unfailing, unfailing. I remember one time in my, I had a jeep in Moscow and it was, you know, it was on the right, it was a, a UK jeep. And I remember one time coming up in the lanes in Moscow in the city, some of them were like four or five lanes and we stopped at this red light, um, which, you know, was a proper red light, a traffic light. And my wife suddenly goes, I got a track and she grabs this stuff. I think I've told the story before, but for those of you who weren't here, and she grabs this stuff and she runs out and there was two girls at the, at the standing at this sort of junction, obviously prostitutes. And she goes over to these two girls, and I'm watching her, I'm watching the other red light here, thinking, oh my goodness, it's going to go green, and I'm going to be holding up like 600 cars behind me. And, and I'm looking, and I'm watching, and I'm looking, and I saw her, and she just, next minute, my wife just grabbed this woman, and she just hugged her, and this woman just hugged her. And, and she then gave her this tract and this booklet, and she came back, and she jumped in the car, and as I did, this woman behind was like, just totally broken standing at the traffic light and my wife comes in she sits beside me and she says I have never in my life ever experienced the love of God as I did just at that very moment and she said to this prostitute Jesus loves you and gives her a tract to help her come to know Christ it may take longer than you expect or hope, but God will come through. For Abraham, it was 25 years. For Moses, 40 years. Joseph, tw 22 years. But God's love never fails. He will not fail you. His love never fails. It's unlimited and unfailing. I was preaching in Dunoon Borough Town Hall just two week weekends ago, uh, yesterday in the Borough Town Hall on Saturday night. And I was sharing about being part of the Franklin Graham event. And I was a supervisor of counselors there at the front and doing all the stuff that I needed to do and how f telling them how 520 people got saved and just encouraging the people. And we had the meeting and then afterwards, um, I was just sort of closing the meeting and I handed back to the worship. There was a couple doing the worship and this lady stood up and said, before I get up and we just sing our last worship song. And can I share a testimony and a story? She said, I was at the Billy Graham, um, at the Franklin Graham event myself, just a few weeks ago, she said. And she said, I was one of the counselors. And this is what she told us. She said, I had the privilege. A 92-year-old man came up and came forward. And this is what he said. He said, I was here in 1955 when Billy Graham was in Glasgow and gave an invitation to receive Christ. And he said, I wanted so much to go forward, but I didn't. I'm coming now. She led him to Christ. 92 years of age. 70 years later, almost to the day. His love never fails. Don't you doubt him. Don't you doubt your father. He's going to come through for you. 
His love is unending, unlimited, unconditional, and unfailing. And now I come to where the reality is, where the rubber meets the road. In Romans 5, 6 to 8, it says, God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is unending. God's love is unlimited. God's love is unconditional. His love is unfailing. But his love is demonstrated. God is not just a talker. We've had enough of talkers politicians and religious leaders and theologians and all the rest of it. Yap, 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 yap. God doesn't talk about his love. God demonstrated his love in this way that while you and I were yet sinners, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to bear our sins past all the way to Adam, all the way to the present and all the way to the future when God decides to wrap this whole thing up. He's covered it all through the demonstration of the cross of Jesus Christ. His son died on the cross, was cruelly tortured for hours till he didn't look like a human being. The Bible says that his, he was marred beyond human likeness. God's word does not lie, does not exaggerate, does not hype. He was marred beyond human likeness. And God, the creator of the entire world, stood back. Let you and I do that to him. Why? Because he loves you and he loves me. And he loves the drunk, and he loves the alcoholic, and he loves the prostitute, and he loves the immoral. Whoever they are, wherever they are, what they've done, he wants them to repent, believe, and be saved. Unless they know how much God loves them, they'll never want to have that love. You have that love. I have that love. I go to bed with that love. I wake up in the morning with that love. I walk through the day. I drive the roads of this country because of the love of God. But there are multitudes around me all the time who have no love like that, don't know it, don't understand it, have never heard about it. And you and I have been charged to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The love of God to take it to them in word and in deed. Some of you maybe heard this story. Oh, no, I'll have to skip that. Ed Coe had a saying, he said, lust is a desire to take from someone else to have for yourself at the expense of another person. The desire to take from someone else at your own desire. Sorry, I'm looking for something here. Uh, I think it's, I've maybe left it behind somewhere. It doesn't matter. I was going to show you three nails that my wife got forged just a few weeks ago at the Louis Friel conference. She actually forged them for me, three old nails. Lust, the desire to take at the expense of another. But love is the desire to give at the expense of self. And God so loved you and so loved me that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Lust takes, love gives, love costs. There is a cost to love, a cost to love. Jesus said this, greater love has no man than this and he laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus didn't just lay down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for his enemies, for those who hated him for those who scourged him, for those who crucified him. He laid down his life for us all, each and every one of us. And the cross is the ultimate sign, a demonstration of God's love. I have, I heard this story. It says, Elia, an elderly Jewish woman, told a Tennessee congregation about the great price that was paid for her to find Christ. She was imprisoned in a concentration camp with no hope for survival. Convinced that he only, convinced that her only chance hinged on an escape, she meticulously made her plans. On the night she broke for freedom, everything went well until she tried to scale the barbed wire barrier. She was halfway up the fence when she was spotted by a Nazi SS guard. At gunpoint, he screamed for her to stop, and she fell to the ground, bleeding and weeping. Her only hope had vanished. But miraculously, the guard recognized 
her as a classmate from school. During their adolescent years, they had been best of friends, but now they were opposite sides of the war. Agonizing over her plight, Ellie cried out to her friend, Oh, Rolf, go ahead and kill me, please. I have no reason to live. The guard replied, Ellie, you're so wrong. There's everything to live for so long as you know who to live for. I'm going to let you go. I will guard you until you climb the wall and get to the other side. But would you promise me one thing? Ellie couldn't believe what was happening. In disbelief, she asked, what is it, Rolf? He said, promise me that when you get on the other side and become free, that you will ask one question continually until someone answers it for you. Ask, why does Jesus Christ make life worth living? Promise me, Ellie. He's the only reason to live. Promise me you'll ask until you get the answer. Ellie shouted, yes, I promise, I promise. Then she scampered over the barbed wire. And as she ran for freedom, she heard several gunshots. She glanced over her shoulder to see if Rolf had changed his mind and was now seeking to kill her. But instead, she saw the bloody dead body of her friend. Upon realizing that he had aided her escape, the other guards shot him for his treason. The hasty promise she had made to gain freedom now took on a new meaning. This young man gave his life for her to have a chance at discovering true freedom in Christ. Ellie told that Tennessee church, I did exactly as Rolf told me to do. I kept asking and asking and asking until one day I met someone who answered his question. I am a Christian today because Rolf sacrificed his life for me. May our witness for Christ be as valiant as that brave young man. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him, whosoever, you're the whosoever, I'm the whosoever, your neighbor's the whosoever. The drunk at the bottom of the road in the alleyway, he's the whosoever. We so often generalize scriptures that if you put your name in that place of the world and of the whosoever, the truth is God loves you and God loves me. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, wherever you've come from, but you need to repent, ask his forgiveness for your sin and put your trust in the death, the burial and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, alone, nothing else. What Jesus did for us, not what we do for him. Because it's God's love is unending, unlimited, unfailing, unconditional. And most of all, it is demonstrated. Demonstrated. It's real. And it's relevant to you and to me today in 2024. There's a famous track that was produced by Pray for Scotland many years ago. It's called The Father's Love Letter. Just about all of you, I'm sure, who are here, who know the Lord, are familiar with this. And I'm going to ask Andrew, um, Andrew, thank you, miss. I'm going to ask our brother to put it on the screen and just to listen. It's about four or five minutes long. I'm finished my message, but after this has played, after Stuart's played it, I'm going to pray. And we're going to pray. Because I felt this earlier on. I haven't, I can't remember the last time I ever did this, but I'm going to ask you. I'm, I'm, so I'm preparing you as we watch and listen to this video clip. I'm preparing you to respond to God this morning, this afternoon to respond to him. And I'm going to pray for salvation. I'm going to pray for healing. I'm going to pray for deliverance. And we're going to stand where we are. I'm going to pray for your salvation of your loved ones, whatever it is, we're going to stand. Because God doesn't, it's not just unending, unlimited, unfailing, unconditional. It is demonstrated. And he wants to demonstrate his love for you 
by saving you, by healing you, by delivering you, by moving on on behalf of your relatives, your friends and your family and even your enemies if you will believe him and trust him this morning. So let's just quiet our hearts. Stuart just plays this clip. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.